Hello everyone. Continuing with the Merchant of Venice, today I will give you the introduction and line-wise summary of Act 1, Scene 2. This scene takes place at Belmont where we see Portia complaining to her lady-in-waiting Nerissa about the scheme that her dead father had devised so that she could find a suitable husband. According to her father's will, Portia's suitors must select the correct casket containing her portrait among the three caskets made of gold, silver and lead. The man who guesses correctly will win her hand in marriage. Nerissa lists the suitors while Portia keeps criticizing their various hilarious faults. These suitors have already left without even attempting in the fear of choosing the wrong casket and losing the bet and ultimately losing the chance of marrying throughout their life. We come to the conclusion of the scene with the entry of a servant who announces the departure of these suitors and the arrival of the Prince of Morocco who has also come to try his luck. We will also find the mention of Bassanio in this scene. Act 1, Scene 2 Belmont, a room in Portia's house. We see Portia and Nerissa entering the scene. Portia, by my troth, Nerissa, my little body is a weary of this great world. Portia says, Oh dear Nerissa, my poor little body is tired of this world. Nerissa, you would be sweet, madam, if your miseries were in the same abundance as your good fortunes are, and yet, for aught I see, they are as sick that surfeit with too much as they that starve with nothing. It is no mean happiness, therefore, to be seated in the mean. Superfluity comes sooner by white hairs, but competency lives longer. Here Nerissa says, My good lady, what I have collected from this world is the fact that there are things in this world that happen strangely. Take, for instance, people, those who have too much, are not at all happy and neither are those who are their beggarly counterparts. The trick is to stay somewhere in between. When you have too much, you tend to get old sooner and having just enough lets you live longer. Portia, good sentences and well pronounced. Portia says, that's a good point. And you have actually said it very well. Nerissa, they would be better if well followed. Nerissa says, it would all be more worthwhile if you could apply this to your personal life. Portia, if to do were as easy as to know what were good to do, chapels had been churches and poor men's cottages, princes' palaces. It is a good divine that follows his own instructions. I can easier teach twenty what were good to be done than be one of the twenty to follow mine own teaching. Portia continues by saying, You think it's that easy? If doing good things were as easy as knowing how to do them, then everyone would be better off in this world. Small chapels would be big churches and poor men's cottages would be princes' palaces. It takes a good priest to practice what he actually preaches. For me, it's easier to lecture 20 people on how to be good rather than to be one of those 20 persons who actually does the good things. Continuing with Portia's speech, the brain may devise laws for the blood, but a hot temper leaps over a cold degree. Such a hair is madness the youth to skip over the measures of good counsel the cripple. But this reasoning is not in the fashion to choose me a husband. O oh, me, the word choose. I may neither choose who I would nor refuse who I dislike. So is the will of a living daughter curbed by the will of a dead father. Is it not hard, Nerissa, that I cannot choose one nor refuse none? Portia continues, saying that the brain can tell the heart what to do, but what does it matter? 
Cold rules don't matter when you have got a hot temper. Young people are like frisky young rabbits and good advice is like a crippled old man trying to catch them. But thinking like this won't help me choose a husband. Oh, the word choose is so strange here. I can't choose who I like or refuse who I dislike. I am a living daughter still controlled by the wishes of her dead father. Isn't it a pain that I cannot choose nor refuse anyone, Nerissa? Nerissa says, Your father was ever virtuous, and holy men at their death have good inspirations. Therefore, the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold, silver and lead, whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you, will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly but one who shall rightly love. But what warmth is there in your affection towards any of these princely suitors that are already come? Nerissa says, Your father was a very noble man, and I believe that people do get odd ideas on their deathbed. However, the riddle designed by him will not let any undeserving suitor claim your hand. Please tell me, is there anyone amongst all those that have arrived that holds a special place in your heart? Portia, I pray thee, overname them, and as thou namest them, I will describe them, and according to my description, level at my affection. Portia then says, you could go through the list, and as you proceed name-wise, I would keep telling you my feelings towards them. Nerissa, first, there is the Neapolitan prince. Nerissa then introduces the first suitor as the prince of Naples. Portia, a, that's a colt indeed, for he doth nothing but talk of his horse, and he makes it a great appropriation to his own good parts that he can shew him himself. Portia laughs and says, Oh, that one! Well, all he seems to know is his horses. He seems to have achieved the end of this world by simply saddling and straddling them. I have my doubts his mother could well have had an affair with a blacksmith. Nerissa then introduces the second suitor. Then there is the county palatine. Nerissa says, then there's the Count Palatine. Portia, he doth nothing but frown, as who should say, and you will not have me choose. He hears merry tales and smiles not. I fear he'll prove the weeping philosopher when he grows old, being so full of unmannerly sadness in his youth. I had rather be married to a death's head with a bone in his mouth than to either of these. God defend me from these two. Portia then says, he does nothing but frown, as if he wants to say, if you don't want me, I don't care. He doesn't even smile when he hears funny stories. If he is so sad and solemn when he is young, I can only imagine how much he'll cry as an old man. No, I would rather be married to a skull with a bone in his mouth rather than be married to either of these two men. God protect me from these two. Nerissa, how say you by the French lord Monsieur Lebon? Nerissa then asks her about her opinion about the French lord Monsieur Lebon. Portia says, God made him and therefore let him pass for a man. In truth, I know it is a sin to be a mocker, but he, why? He hath a horse better than the Neapolitans. A better bad habit of frowning than the Count Palatine. He is every man in no man. If a throstle sing, he falls straight a capering. He will fence with his own shadow. If I should marry him, I should marry twenty husbands. If he would despise me, I would forgive him. For if he love me to madness, I shall never requit him. Portia says, we might as well call him a man since God created him. No, I know if it is bad to make fun of people, but still. 
His horse is better than the Neapolitans and he frowns more than the Count Palatine. He was trying to outdo everyone so much that you couldn't tell who he actually was. He started dancing every time a bird sang and he was so eager to show off his fencing that he would fight with his own shadow. If I married him, I might as well marry 20 husbands because he's like 20 men all rolled into one. I would understand if he hated me since even if he loved me desperately, I would never be able to love him in return. Nerissa, what say you then to Falconbridge, the young baron of England? Nerissa then asks her about the next suitor, Falconbridge, the English baron. Portia, you know, I say nothing to him, for he understands not me, nor I him. He hath neither Latin, French, nor Italian, and you will come into the court and swear that I have a poor pennyworth in the English. He is a proper man's picture, but alas, who can converse with a dumb show? How oddly he is suited. I think he bought his doublet in Italy, his round hose in France, his bonnet in Germany, and his behavior everywhere. Talking about the next suitor, Portia says, I have no opinion of him. We don't talk because we don't understand each other. He doesn't speak Latin, French or Italian and you know how little English I speak. He is great looking. But how can you talk to someone who doesn't speak your language? He was dressed so oddly that I think he got his jacket in Italy, his tights in France, his hat in Germany and his behavior from everywhere. Nerissa, what think you of the Scottish Lord, his neighbor? Nerissa asks, what do you think of his neighbor, the Scottish Lord? Portia, that he hath a neighborly charity in him, for he borrowed a box of the ear of the Englishman and swore he would pay him again when he was able. I think the Frenchman became his surety and sealed under for another. Portia then says, I think he is very forgiving, since he let the Englishman slap him on the ear without hitting him back. Rather than defend himself, he just threatened to pay the Englishman back later. Then the Frenchman promised to help the Scot pay the Englishman back and added a slap of his own. Nerissa how like you, the young German, the Duke of Saxony's nephew? Nerissa then asks Portia about the next suitor, the young German, the Duke of Saxony's nephew. Portia, very wildly in the morning when he is sober and most wildly in the afternoon when he is drunk. When he is best, he is a little worse than a man. And when he is worst, he is little better than a beast. And the worst fall that ever fell, I hope I shall make shift to go without him. Portia makes fun of him and says, He is quite unpresentable in the morning when he is sobering up, and even worse in the afternoon when he is drunk. At his best, he is a little less than a man, and at his worst, he is a little more than an animal. If he ever got married and he tragically met his demise, I'm sure I would definitely find a way to go on without him. Nerissa, if he should offer to choose and choose the right casket, you should refuse to perform your father's will if you should refuse to accept him. Nerissa then says, but if he offers to play the game and chooses the right box, but then you will have to reject him or you will be disobeying your father's last wishes. Portia, therefore, for fear of the worst, I pray thee, set a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket, for if the devil be within, and that temptation without, I know he will choose it. I will do anything, Neritha, er, I will be married to a sponge. Portia then says, then just to avoid this, just put a glass of the finest wine in one of the wrong boxes. I am sure he would be tempted and choose the wrong casket. 
I would rather not marry than marry a drunkard. Nerissa then says, You need not fear, lady, the having any of these lords. They have acquainted me with their determinations, which is indeed to return to their home and to trouble you with no more suit, unless you may be won by some other sort than your father's imposition depending on the caskets. Nerissa consoles Portia by saying that you don't have to worry about any of these lords, my lady. They have all told me what they want, that is, to go back home and give up on you, unless there was some other way to win you than your father's pick-the-box test. Portia, if I live to be as old as Sibylla, I will die as chaste as Dinah, unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will. I am glad this parcel of words are so reasonable, for there is not one among them but I dote on his very absence, and I pray God grant them a fair departure. Hoshia is relieved and says, I wish all of them a safe departure home, as also I regard their sensibility. I could die an old maid if need be so, and stay unmarried if my suitors were of this nature. The only thing I like about all of them is that they are all very reasonable and I would not feel their absence in my life. Nerissa, do you not remember, lady, in your father's time, a Venetian, a scholar and a soldier that came hither in company of the Marquis of Montferrat? Nerissa says, do you remember a Venetian scholar and soldier who accompanied the Marquis of Montferrat here once when your father was still alive? Portia, yes, yes, it was Bassanio, as I think was so he called. Portia immediately says, yes, yes, that was Bassanio. I think that was his name. Nerissa, true madam, he of all the men that ever my foolish eyes looked upon was the best deserving a fair lady. Nerissa says, Yes, madam, that's the one. He deserves a beautiful wife more than all the other men I have ever seen. Portia, I remember him well, and I remember him worthy of thy praise. Portia says, I remember him well, and the praise you bestow on him is really worthwhile. Enter a servant. How now? What news? While Portia and Nerissa are having the conversation, a servant enters the room. Portia asks him, Do you have any news? Servant, the four strangers seek for you, madam, to take their leave. And there is a forerunner come from a fifth, the prince of Morocco, who brings word the prince, his master, will be here tonight. The servant says, No, madam, I just came to inform you that the four suitors are on their way back home and would like to let you know the same. The fifth suitor, the prince of Morocco, is scheduled to arrive by evening and he will be taking up the challenge. Portia, if I could bid the fifth welcome with so good a heart as I can bid the other four farewell, I should be glad of his approach. If he have the condition of a saint and the complexion of a devil, I had rather he should shrive me than wife me. Come, Nerissa, sirrah, go before. Whilst we shut the gates, upon one boor, another knocks at the door. Portia concludes by saying that if I could say hello to the fifth one as happily as I'll say goodbye to the first four, I would be very happy about his arrival. If he is as good as a saint, but is as black as the devil, I would rather he hear my confession than marry me. Let's go, Nerissa. Turning to the servant, she informs him to go ahead. And then, turning to Nerissa, she says, As soon as we shut the door to one suitor, another one starts knocking at the door. With this, we come to the end of the explanation of Act 1, Scene 2.
In my upcoming video, we will continue with Act 1, Scene 3. If you wish to get regular updates, do not forget to hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.